you have a Bible, I'm going to begin a brand new series of messages this morning, so I'm glad you're here uh, for it, for uh, our initial message in this series. Uh, our text is 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. This message, or this series of messages, deals with one subject, and that is what to expect in the last days. What to expect in the last days. I think we should know. I think we should know what we can expect in the world in the last days. Now, here's what Paul says, writing to Timothy, Beginning in 2 Timothy chapter 3, he says, This know also, uh, or know this, you know, make sure you know this, that in the last days, in what days? In the last days. In the last days. The word last here is the Greek word eschatos. It's where we get, in, in the study of theology, it's where we get the word eschatology. Eschatology is the doctrine of, or the study of, last things. The last things that the Bible says will occur on planet earth comes from eschatos. So, Paul wants the church to know something. Know this, that in the last days, perilous times, this word means difficult, dangerous. Uh, the word is sometimes translated grievous. Perilous times shall come. Now this isn't a might or a maybe or a could be, but they shall come. Perilous, dangerous, grievous, hard. The word also means hard. Hard, difficult times will come. Where will they come, you think? Well, they'll come on earth. They'll come on mankind. In the last days. And then he tells us what those times will be like. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, Truce breakers. This simply means they, they never ever forgive. They know how to carry a grudge. Truce breakers. False accusers. Incontinent. Fierce. People who can't be controlled. Despisers of those that are good. Traitors. Heady. Stubborn. Headstrong. Bullheaded. High minded. Puffed up, conceited. Lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such, turn away. The New King James translates it this way. I'm going to read those same verses in the NKJV. But know this. That in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God having a form of godliness, but denying its power, and from such people turn away. Again, I want to emphasize that the Bible says this will characterize men. When it says men, it means it in the generic sense, mankind. Uh, this will characterize mankind in the last days. It's interesting, but the last... I've noticed just over the last year, numerous polls have come out in Christian media, magazines, even some newspaper articles that said many Americans, in fact, up to 50% of adult Americans 
say they believe we're living in the last days. Isn't that interesting? Up to 50% of adult Americans say that they believe, just judging by what they see in the world, uh, the escalation of uh, major catastrophes, whether it's tornadoes, earthquakes, volcanic activity, tsunamis, but they see in world events cataclysms that point to the fact that, you know, this, this is probably it. And then they see what's happening in the world as far as uh, the increasing violence, uh, bloodshed, hatred, murder, strife, terrorism, wars all over the world. One of the things Jesus, our Lord, said would characterize the last days, wars and rumors of wars, actual wars and news of wars from far away that maybe you get scant reports from, but you know right now there are wars all over the world. Uh, it's happening right now, many wars, millions of people being killed uh, all over the world, and the Lord does say that that would characterize the last days. So, many people, I'm talking about average American, European, not so much European, I don't know what they believe, but Americans... <laughs> Uh, say that they believe we're living in the last days as the Bible depicts them to be. Just seeing what they see. Uh, you know, it was just four months ago that that 20-year-old young man walked into an elementary school, in San Sandy Hook Elementary School in Connecticut, and killed 20 children and, uh, and killed six of their teachers and workers at the school. That was only four months ago. Just before that, it was in a movie theater. And uh, here we had the Boston bombings. People look at an increasing inhumanity, a lack of conscience, an increasing godlessness, and increase in terrorist activities. And they equate that with the unraveling of society, the unraveling of order as we know it. And that points to... The fact that, uh, you know, it seems like we're living in the last days. Especially when you see these catastrophic events that have happen been happening with increasing frequency and increasing potency, that it seems like our very world, the very fabric of our world is unraveling. So, look, it could be. It could very well be that we are living in the last days, that the earth uh, is in travail even now and that uh, things are winding up and drawing to a close as the Lord prepares to return to the earth. Now I know that there's always been violence on the earth. We all know that. There's always been crime, violence, murder, uh, all the way back to Cain and Abel. When brother killed brother. So we know violence has a long, long history on the earth. We know that there's always been wars and bloodshed. Uh, the Bible itself records many wars in the ancient world. And we know that wars have continued throughout human history. So what makes now so different than before? I mean, why now do we say these are the last days? There's always been violence, always been war. There's always been natural disaster, catastrophes, and so on. What makes now uh, the natural disasters we're seeing now, the, the calamities, the terrorism, wars, and so on, what makes now so special that we would equate this with the last days? What's really so different uh, since these things have been going on since the beginning of time? Well, in these next few messages, these next few weeks, we're going to take a few weeks and cover this ground. I'm going to argue for the position that our nation, uh, our society, in fact, our entire world has turned a corner, that things have changed, that another page has been turned in not only American history but in the world's history. I will argue over the next couple of weeks that while there has always been wars and plagues and bloodshed and violence and crime and immorality and disasters and so on, what we're seeing now, what we're witnessing now is in many ways unprecedented. Uh, we have entered into, you could say, unchartered territory in many ways. Uh, we have witnessed uh, horror 
murder, mayhem, hatred, terrorism on a scale never quite witnessed before uh, and in a frequency uh, never quite witnessed before. And it's not confined to one part of the world, but it's everywhere. These things are going on everywhere. Some parts of the world are worse than others, to be sure. But my argument will be over the next couple of weeks that we have, in fact, turned a, turned a corner. Today, uh, I'm going to kind of give you an... This is orientation. Let's call it orientation. If you ever started a new job, a new position, new company or whatever, there's always an orientation time where they just familiarize you with who you're going to be working with, where you're going to be working, what you're going to be doing, who you're going to be answering to, what's expected of you, what you can expect from this company, uh, you know, a little familiarization with the facility and so forth, kind of what to expect and what we expect of you. If you've ever been to school, college, university of any kind, you know orientation is important. It's to put you at ease, give you a little information about the the facility, the classes, the layout, the teachers, the courses. Maybe there's advisors present to show you around, answer some questions. The whole idea is to make the student a little more comfortable, a little more familiar, you know, because you get out of high school, you walk into a university campus. <laughs> that can be overwhelming. So uh, the whole idea of orientation is you get an idea of what to expect. Here's what to expect. It's an introduction, you might say, to the school and, and so forth. Uh, it'll help reduce your anxiety, help you assimilate into the new surroundings, help you to adjust. Y'all following? Amen. Also, orientation is a time when the student or the new employee learns about the policies. You might say the protocol of the university or uh, of the new facility, the new job. So I believe this is important too. We're going to consider this sort of an orientation to the last days. If in fact we are in the last days, then we need to be oriented to it so we know what to expect. We have an idea of what's coming, uh, what we, so that we don't respond the wrong way. And we need to know God's protocols. That is, what are His uh, procedures and principles? What, what we can expect and what He expects of us. If you are indeed men and women who live in the last days, then we need to know these things so that, well, we don't panic. Uh, I mean, what do you do? What are many people doing right now? I'll tell you what many are doing. They are panicking. It's hardly a week goes by that I don't hear of Christians who are doing things that... That's not the divine protocol. I mean, that's not the procedure that the Lord enacted for us. But what are they doing? Well, they think that the best thing to do... They say, you know, I'm looking at the signs of the times. I see what's happening in the world. I see what's happening in our own government. These are the last days. I'm retreating to the wilderness. I'm going to go to the some remote hills and I'm going to store up uh, guns and ammo and uh, and get ready for the black helicopters or or whatever it is. You've got others who feel like it's time for Christians to withdraw from government and society, you know, and, and go dark. Go dark. Cut up your ID. Get rid of your driver's license. Get rid of your credit cards. Uh, get off the government's radar because the government's going to be your enemy. Listen, Christians are preaching this. Many Christians are preaching it. It's coming from many corners as well that uh, you need to go dark. Go dark. That don't even sound right. <laughs> You've got others who say that we should do just the opposite. Let's jump with both feet into the world's politics. And uh, let's do everything we can to halt this slide uh, into socialism or communism or wherever it is we're going. Let's do everything we can. Let's get involved. Let's get out 
and vote, let's get out and register, let's get out and picket protest and do our thing to, because it's up to us. If we don't do it, it's not going to get done. God expects us to do these things and they believe this is part of being uh, salt and light. So is this the divine protocol? Is this what God would have us do? Is this the right policy to adapt? Do we take one extreme? Do we take another extreme? You see, some people would think, well, getting involved right now with the politics of the world would be a whole lot like uh, let's rearrange all the, the uh, lounge chairs on the Titanic. Uh, you know, it's kind of late for that. It's, we've hit the iceberg. This thing's going down. It doesn't matter how you rearrange the furniture. It's too late. So orientation, I do believe orientation is important because it answers many of these questions. It helps us to see the bigger picture from a divine perspective. And I, I want to remind you, uh, as I have to remind myself often, I am first and foremost a citizen of heaven. I count myself an American citizen, and I am not ashamed to declare that I am. Uh, I don't like everything our country does. It's a terrible country. It's a terrible place to live. It's, it's the worst place in the world except for every place else. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't want to live any place else. That's, that's the truth, unless the Lord sent me someplace else to live. But is it a broken system and a broken government with a broken judicial system and a broken educational system and a broken legal system? Absolutely, it's broken. Uh, the whole world is broken, and in no society is it any better. I do consider myself a patriot when it comes to America. I would never betray my country. Never under any circumstances would I betray my country. Unless, of course, my country demanded that I betray my Lord, who is who I owe my highest allegiance to. And every Christian owes our highest allegiance, first and foremost, to our Savior. But I want us to be aware that our government, nor any other government on earth, is trying to be faithful to the Lord or to the teachings of Scripture. There is no theocracy any place on earth. America, overall, in general, remains a nation in rebellion to its maker. We pray for our country. We ask the Lord to use us here, to be light and salt here. But when the Lord comes, He's coming. He's going to judge America, if not as severely, then more severely than any nation on earth because of the grace he's bestowed upon it to whom much is given much required so this orientation pretty much is to help us to recognize what we can expect in these last days and i want to begin right here in second timothy chapter three not only with these verses but with one more verse that's going to be a principle uh, that I think is actually a key verse in this series of messages. It's found in verse 13. It goes right along with the first verses that we read, what mankind will be like in the last days. Isn't that what the Bible says? In the last days, this is how men are going to be, right? Down in verse 13, it doesn't lose that train of thought. In fact, it continues that very same train of thought. And in a prophetic this continues a prophetic voice from the Apostle Paul telling us not what might be, but what will be in the last days. He says, know this. Remember, verse 1, know this. In the last days, men shall be, they will be, lovers of their own selves, lovers of money, so on. And then in, down, in verse 13, he says, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now, according to 
the Bible. We should be aware that evil is actually going to increase in the world. Men are evil. Men are evil. But they're not as evil as they can be. And in the Bible, according to the Bible, men are going to become increasingly evil in the last days. In fact, evil men, this pretty much describes verses 1 through 5 right here. The, the verses we just read. Evil men. The word means wicked. In fact, it's the same word that's used of the devil in 1 John chapter 5 when he's called that wicked one. Men will be wicked like that. Depra the word means to be depraved. To be vicious, to be vile, to be callous, to be cold, cruel, wanton, lawless, evil men. There are evil men in the world. There are plenty of them. And seducers, interesting word. Uh, seducers is another, rather a big word. It has to do with deception. Some, some versions translate the word imposters because that's what it means to be a counterfeit to be a fraud to be a deceiver seducers but but it goes further than that this I'm going to save this for another of our studies uh, later on in this series but this word seducer is also connected you can't disconnect it from the idea of sorcery magic and uh, occultism so Think about that. Uh, and here's what the Bible says about these evil men and seducers, deceivers, imposters, and so on. They will wax worse and worse. The word wax means just to grow. They will grow worse and worse. They will become worse and worse. They will rapidly grow increasingly worse. That is, in their evil and in their depravity, uh, as time passes, here's the message that, you know, again, this is orientation. So let's see if we can't orient ourselves to the last days according to the scripture as time passes and we draw closer and closer to the coming of the Lord. The world is not going to become a better place. It's not going to become a safer place. Uh, mankind will not increase in goodness uh, overall. It, people will not become kinder and more gentle. And uh, uh, there, it will not be a place of fairness and justice for all. Uh, I, would to God that were true. That's not to negate the fact that there won't be people getting saved who are becoming better people because of it. That's going to happen as well. People will be getting saved. People will be returning to the Lord. People will be repenting and, and uh, their lives will be transformed. But in a general overview, as a general rule, a general perspective, the world is going to become worse. Evil men and seducers are going to grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And they'll keep on going from bad to worse. Uh, so... That's not pleasant to think of, but I think it does help us to orient to the new setting that we're entering into, a new reality. It tells you what to expect, so you don't have unrealistic expectations. It'll help you to adjust and realize that the world, well, the evil in the world is not going to decrease. That's not being negative. Hello. Brother Rusty, you, you really are a negative preacher. Well, I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Evil men and seducers are going to wax increasingly worse. Look, this is in the same context as verses 1 through 5. In fact, the verses following that as well. And the context is in the last days. In the last days. That's what the Bible says. The evil in the world is not going to decrease, unfortunately. Uh, you know, there may be places in the world, communities, where they will see a decrease, perhaps, in crime. That's going to happen. Uh, 
But those are kind of blips, you know, on the radar. They won't last for long. Uh, I, I read recently where some cities have been touting the fact that our murder rate is down and our burglary rate is down and, uh, you know, rape is up and this is up and that's up. But, you know, our, our crime is going down. Well, I, I would like to think things will go down. At least they're going to be little waves here and there. Things will decrease. Things will increase. But overall, I, let me just ask you a question. Let me ask you a, a question. I want you to think just for a moment. Do you honestly think that America is safer today than it was when you were a kid? I mean, do you think it's a safer place? Now, some neighborhoods are safer than others, but the, the fact is, no neighborhood is safe. No neighborhood. I grew up, I would ride my bicycle to Pontchartrain Beach. I would take the bus and go downtown, me and my friends. We were 12 and 13 years old. We spent the whole day downtown. We walked through the French Quarter. They had a pet store in the French Quarter I couldn't stay away from. I had every kind of little furry critter you can imagine. It came from a little... A little shop over there. I had to go there every Saturday if I could. I'd take the bus. If I, my, my mom and dad never heard from me all day long. They're probably glad they didn't. But, I, but when I got home, it was just about dark. Let me ask you another question. If you have small children, would you let them go play in the front of the house, just up and down the street, unsupervised? Did your mom and dad let you do that? So what do you think? That maybe the world isn't as safe as it used to be. Is it... Look, I have read some of these uh, stats where some point to the fact that, look, our world is a better world. This is a better world today than it was yesterday. And uh, let me tell you why they declare that that's so. Because of our technology, because of our advances in medicine, it's, be, it's, it's because, look, people are living longer today. I, I don't know. My great-grandparents lived to be pretty old. Yeah. But overall, they say, life is longer. The uh, mortality rate for infants and children is down. So that's a good thing. People, you know, we've got better medicine today. I do believe that's true as well. You could point to several factors. You could point to the fact that we can jump on a plane. We can be in London tonight. So, could our parents do that? Or our grandparents? No. I mean, there have been rapid advances in science and technology and medicine and travel. Mankind is increasing in knowledge. But did you know the Bible predicted that that too would characterize the last days? That there would be an increase in human knowledge? Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4. You don't have to turn there, but here's what it says. The angel gave this profound revelation of the last days to Daniel. And then he says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. He says, Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. So in the last days, this running to and fro, Mankind would be able to do that. Something they couldn't do in biblical days, our grandparents couldn't really do it. Maybe they could get on a ship and in a month they'd be across the ocean. You can get on a plane and be there in hours. Yeah. My grandfather traveled by horseback. Today, you drive in an automobile, you drive 60, 70 miles an hour on a that's, that's an advance. The Bible says men would be able to do that. They would be able to run to and fro, and knowledge would increase. Let me tell you, right now, knowledge is increasing so fast it boggles the mind. What's new, brand new today, is, is history tomorrow. These advances in technology, uh, the ability to... It, it, you, you just can't keep up with it. But here's an interesting thought. While all of these things are advancing, technology, medicine, and so forth, the Bible still says that mankind, men themselves, would be becoming more depraved. Amen. Technology advances, behavior deteriorates. Character deteriorates. Integrity deteriorates. Behavior 
becomes more and more perverse. So we can make it possible to walk on the moon, but still unsafe to walk in your neighborhood after dark. We have the technology to fly into space, but we don't have enough safety in our own community to be outside after dark, almost no matter what neighborhood you're in. The Bible declares that to be true as well. So while, yes, technology advances, mankind continues to become increasingly depraved. Well, these are all part of, part and parcel of living in the last days. Now, what can you expect? The Bible tells us one of the things you can certainly expect is that the world is going to become increasingly violent, increasingly lawless, increasingly ruthless, and we do have scripture that declares that to be the case. We're, we're getting oriented to the last days. What can we expect during this orientation period? What, when we go out the doors, what, what can we expect? You can expect that the world is going to become more and more dangerous. That men are going to become more and more violent. You see, this is what makes our world unique. There have always been wars. There's always been violence, but never before has mankind had the capability to annihilate himself and, in fact, annihilate the entire world. Amen. They could go to war. They could kill thousands. They could kill tens of thousands. Today, they count them by the millions. Never before have we had that kind of capability. For all of our technology, what it enables us to do is kill people more expediently. Uh, Genesis chapter 6 is an interesting passage. If you'll keep your finger where you are, but I want to read a verse or two over here. It's a passage I know you're familiar with, but allow me to read it to you again. Genesis chapter 6 deals with the world in Noah's day and tells us what Noah's world was like. It gives us a little insight as well as to what the world will be like in the last days because I'll remind you of something the Lord said in Matthew chapter 24, verses 37, 38, 39. He said this, As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. And then let's see, just rem remind you how it was in the days of Noah. Uh, a few verses we'll pick out, like verse 5. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5 says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. This is a, definitely a condemnation of mankind in Noah's day, that wickedness was great, mankind was corrupt, and that... Every imagination, that is, their entire being, was consumed with what they wanted to do, and, and it was all wicked. Everything they wanted to do was wrong. Everything they wanted to do was contrary to what the divine protocol is, uh, uh, God's procedures, God's policies. It was Everything was contrary to the Lord. He says, the thoughts of his heart was only evil, and that continually. Only evil, consumed with evil, consumed with sinful activity, and that continually. He says in verse 11, the earth also was corrupt. Interesting word. It means to be decayed, to be rotten, to be spoiled, to be ruined. In a moral sense, it means to be perverse. It means to be decadent. It means to be defiled. The earth was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Filled with violence. This is in Noah's world. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. The earth was filled with violence. This word also, by the way, uh, means not, not only physical violence, but just to be wrong. It means to be injurious to others. It, it, it carries the word, uh, the meaning of cruelty and unrighteousness and 
falsehood. So what we see, Genesis chapter 6, the days of Noah, a world growing increasingly violent, increasingly lawless, increasingly ruthless, increasingly immoral, depraved, corrupt, bankrupt, morally, spiritually. Isn't that what the Bible says? Amen. All of men's desires were evil, and that continually. Violence was widespread, and remember what the Lord said, Matthew 24, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. A world filled with violence. And yet, even in their violent world, people were carrying on as though it was life as usual. No real repentance, uh, remorse, no real conviction of sin. The idea being, you know, the Lord says, you know, they're marrying, they're giving in marriage, they're eating, they're drinking. They're oblivious to their peril. Oblivious to their peril. Now, do you believe that characterizes our world? Is, is mankind in just oblivious to their peril? Do they have any idea that they're living on the edge of a, of a precipice? As it was in the days of Noah. Carrying on as usual, but godless. Godless. So, an increasing godlessness, you could say, characterized. Noah's day as well. You know, uh, law and order, justice, we, we might say, is necessary for any society uh, to survive and to thrive. There has to be law, there has to be order, there has to be justice, or society unravels. It cannot, it cannot thrive. Uh, do you think that we are sliding into lawlessness, uh, into anarchy even. And uh, it seems to me, and I, I believe that I'm not alone in this, but it seems to me that our society, as it slides further and further into lawlessness, as even politics becomes more and more corrupt, that a society that unhealthy cannot continue to survive and thrive for long. Let me give you a little homespun illustration, if I can. You have to have air to breathe, right? You need big gulps of good, fresh air, clean air to be able to breathe and to sustain life for your body to function like it's supposed to, for your blood cells, everything to get all the... Air is necessary. It's necessary for you to sustain life. And if you're breathing foul, polluted, defiled air, you're going to be sick. You are going to be unhealthy. I see pictures in, of people in China, people in India, people in Korea even. Many parts of the world where uh, they actually wear masks every day when they go outdoors because the, the quality of their air is so poor. It's going to lead to a breakdown in your health, a breakdown in your body. You're going to die young. You cannot thrive. You cannot be healthy. You cannot raise healthy children living and breathing garbage into your lungs. I mean, that's obvious. For you and me, we need air. We need air to breathe. For a society, for a society to exist, to thrive, to grow, it must have law and order. That is a society's air. That's the air it breathes. It must have law, order, justice. These things are required for any society. When that breaks down, society itself breaks down, and it becomes very, very unhealthy and unpleasant. All you have to do is look around the world and see where law and order has broken down. How, how many of us would like to move to Syria? You know, real estate's cheap over there. You could probably buy a bunch of acres, uh, dirt cheap. 
there's no law and order. I mean, it's lawless. Uh, and it's that way in many parts of the world right now where government has broken down, anarchy prevails, wars, civil wars, lawlessness. You don't want to live there. That's an unhealthy place to live. You don't want to raise your children there. People are fleeing there by the tens of thousands getting away as fast as they can. Hello. I want you to listen to something that was written by an English satirist and journalist many years ago. Uh, he said, The basic condition for a civilization is that there should be law and order. Obviously, this is coming to an end. The world is falling into chaos, even perhaps, especially, our Western world. There are many other symptoms. The excessive interest in eroticism is characteristic of the end of a civilization. Then the excessive need for excitement, like entertainment, he's calling it, which, of course, the games provided for the Romans and television provides for us. Even the enormously complicated structure of taxation and administration is a symptom of the end of a civilization. Then he talks about a few other things that characterize the end of a civilization, a civilization too, like boredom. <laughs> but I did find it interesting that, they, that he pointed out that when law and order ends, society unravels. Why, Brother Rusty, is this different than before? I mean, haven't there always been, always been anarchy and rebellion and defiance of, of government and, you know, war? Jesus said it, wars and rumors of wars and so forth. What makes this so different? Well, in the last 100 years, of human history, which 100 years is a very, very short period of time in human history. You know, that's a, that's a blip. In the last 100 years, we've had two major world wars. World War I, while statistics are impossible, you know, to be exact, but we know that over 16 million people died in World War I. Over 16 million. Uh, that would be civilian and military casualties over 16 million no real count of just how many more world war two i just read recently where there are some statistics who calculate that the human toll in world war two was upwards of 85 million people when you start adding up civilian and military deaths all over the world because it was a world war a genuine world war there was suffering mayhem destruction and death on all corners of the globe up to 85 million people killed, military and civilian. Add those two up, you've got 100 million people who died in World Wars I and II in just a short period of time, just within the last 100 years. Such a thing was never possible before, never possible on such a scale. Like I said, they could ride on their horses and they could kill a few, they could kill thousands, they could kill th but 100 million people. Never before possible, there is technology today that increases our ability to kill, maim, cripple. But it's done nothing to increase our humanity. Because while the technology increases, our humanity deteriorates. So that just as the Bible predicts, as it was in the days of Noah, the Bible says, 2 Timothy chapter 3, this is the way men are going to be in the last days, lovers of their own selves, uh, and so forth. We have become a cold, cruel, ungodly world. I mean, just overall. You add to this the capability that some nations have today with nuclear weapons. We've got nations with nuclear weapons today. North Korea, God help us. Iran is on the cusp of a nuclear armament. God forbid that they should get it because they're determined. They've promised to annihilate Israel. They've threatened the West repeatedly. Countries like Pakistan, now there's a picture of stability for you. They've got numerous nuclear weapons. 
Russia, the former Soviet Union, is said to have the largest stockpile of nuclear weapons anywhere, 4,650 nuclear warheads. 4,650. And they're scattered all over, even some parts of the former Soviet Republic. I hope they can keep up with these things. Uh, we don't even know for sure if they know where all of their warheads are. So imagine that getting into the hands of uh, America's enemies, uh, Israel's enemies, civilization's enemies. It's a dangerous world. Uh, this doesn't even count the countries, including Russia, including China, that have developed extensive biological weapons and chemical weapons. Some of the biological weapons are more frightening than nuclear warfare, uh, almost, uh, to the point that they can reduce a civilization. We live on a powder keg. You know what a powder keg is? I'm not talking about talcum powder. <laughs> you know, back in the days of, uh, say, the Civil War or, or earlier when gunpowder was stored gunpowder was stored in a keg literally in a barrel you better keep that powder safe and secure and away from sparks because if you wanted to load a cannon you had to put powder down the cannon barrel and then they'd shove a ba uh, ball down there and they'd fire it you know like the powder powder extremely volatile extremely explosive handle it with extreme care because anything can ignite it even that would ignite it. That's correct. That's absolutely correct. So, when you say we live on a powder keg, the earth is a powder keg. And, and all it would take is a spark to cause chaos that is unmentionable, destruction that is unfathomable. And there are plenty, plenty people in the world who would be happy to light that spark. Many, many people. Hate-filled, evil, vile, depraved, callous, cold, full of hate. They would be happy to blow themselves up along with everybody that they can kill. They'd be happy uh, to light that spark. There are thousands of demon-possessed people like that right now uh, all over the earth. We, we do live on a powder keg. And uh, once again, I would mention that what makes this the last days and not previous times, because for the first time in human history, we have the capability of annihilating mankind, destroying the entire planet and everything alive on it. There have been violent wars before, but nothing like in the last century. In fact, wars continue all over the world right now. Millions have been killed. I've got a group of statistics here that, that I could give you that would just make you sad. Millions dying in the ongoing tribal wars of Africa. I could mention names to you like Idi Amin or Pol Pot or Saddam Hussein, all of which were responsible for the deaths, not just of thousands, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, but of millions of people. I would also remind you that terrorism remains a real threat, both domestic and foreign, domestic terrorists and foreign terrorists. Look, as we speak, this, this doesn't even take into consideration the violence that's taking place just south of our border. Mexico is almost in a, in a state of complete anarchy. There are entire states in Mexico controlled by d drug gangs. Many parts of Central America are in the same state of affairs. That anarchy is ever moving towards the American border. Uh, there are criminal elements in these drug gangs that have absolutely no regard for men, women, or children. This is such a happy message, Brother Rusty. We're... <laughs> We are in the bloodiest time of human history. But again, I would point out to you that this is orientation. This is just to let you know, in the last days, this is what you can expect. That way you don't panic when you say, what is going on with all this mayhem, this crime, this violence, these wars, these acts of terrorism? 
What's going on? Why isn't God doing anything? This is what God said would occur in the last days. This is exactly what He said would occur in the last days. He said society itself would begin to unravel. Mankind growing worse and worse, deceiving, being deceived. Now, that being said, what are the protocols? That is, what are the divine policies for men and women who live in an unraveling society? We live in a world, we see this escalating violence. What do we do? Do we panic? Do we run to the hills? Do we, do we take up arms? Do we, do we need to build bunkers? Do we need to uh, build bomb shelters? Or do we need to run to some other corner of the globe like it's going to be safer over there? Like the devil doesn't get there. Well, I want to give you a couple of quick verses this morning that deal with the divine protocol. That is, what does God expect of you? What are His policies for His people to help you in the last days? A uh, couple of quick verses. I want you to look with me to Romans chapter 13. I'm going to begin there. These are principles to govern us, to guide us at all times. Good days, bad days, days of peace and calm, and we like those days. Days of chaos. Uh, they, have to, they have to govern our lives at all times. We taught on some of these verses recently in our Wednesday night Bible studies when we were dealing with ethics, Christian's attitude. Uh, towards government, uh, but I'm going to read these verses in this context because they do bear on uh, not only every day but the, the last days as well. Uh, Romans 13, beginning in verse 1, Let every soul, that is every one of you, every soul, every person, no exceptions, be subject unto the higher powers. This simply means the government that is in power. Be subject no exceptions, every one of you, be subject to the authorities that are in power. Whatever part of the world you live in. He says, for there is no authority but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. That is, God has arranged that those parties would be in office. Whosoever therefore resists the authorities, resists the arrangement, the appointment, the institution, the ordinance of God, they that resist shall receive to themselves condemnation. The word there is condemnation or judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the authorities? That is, you should show them respect. Do that which is good, you'll have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to you for good. But if you do that which is evil, that is, if you break the law, you should be afraid, for he bears not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger, to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore you must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but for conscience's sake. And for this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. The idea here is pay your taxes, be in subjection to your government, Brother Rusty, you can't expect us to be in subjection to a government that is godless, that seems to be moving more towards false religion or no religion. Actually, I didn't write these things. Uh, I just read them, that's all. I just read them. This is what God says. It's His Word. Take it up with Him. He gives us the divine protocol. Here's his procedure. You're a Christian. Doesn't matter what corner of the world you live in. Doesn't matter what government is in office. He says you be subject. No Christian should ever be guilty of anarchy, rebellion, defiance against government because God is the one who establishes government. And even a broken government is better than no government. 
A broken government is better than no government. Otherwise, you live in total anarchy, lawlessness, where roving gangs of bandits and thugs rape and rob and kill wantonly, indiscriminately, without, without any hindrance. You and I are called in these last days and at all times to be sub subject to those in authority. The only time we can excuse our lack of submission and subjection is if they ever call us to disobey our highest allegiance. And that is to the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to read another passage. This one from 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter 2 verse 13. If you can hang with me just a little bit longer. First Peter 2, verse 13. Submit yourselves. So Paul said it. Now Peter says it. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man. He's talking here about the human government. Whatever the instituted authority is. By the way, I don't want to forget to mention this. When Paul wrote those things that we just read in Romans 13, Nero was emperor. So he's not saying just submit to good government. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man and do it for the Lord's sake. Whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God, that you with well-doing may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free, not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God, verse 17, honor, esteem, respect, value all men. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. Swallow real hard. And read it again. Because your Bible says that too. Honor the king. No Christian should be guilty of anarchy. Or rebellion. Do not contribute to the demise of society. Law and order is any society's air. It's the very air we breathe. You contribute to the demise of law and order. You contribute to the demise of civilization and your own demise as well. It's law and order that keeps the wolves from your door. I don't like paying taxes any more than anybody else. I just got an enormous tax bill and I didn't like it. But I praise God, I was able to pay it. And, and I know that there are things that gets done with my tax dollars that I don't like. But I also know that they keep lights on in my neighborhood, that they keep bridges intact so I can drive over them. They keep police on the streets to guard you and me. They keep the military around our nation. You contribute your taxes, you pay your taxes, you contribute to law and order. Even if it's a broken system, and it's broken, yeah. it's better than none. Amen. According to the scripture, a broken government is better than no government. Titus chapter 3, last verse, I'm going to read this one. Titus chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Paul again, writing to Titus, the pastor... Concerning the church, church members, he says, put them in mind, that is, you remind them, remind believers to be subject to principalities and powers. He's talking here about the human authority, the human government. Uh, whatever government you're under, you tell the church, you tell believers that they be subject to those human authorities. Do not be a rebel. Do not be defiant. Do not be godless. Do not be an anarchist. He says, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of your government. I'm sorry. To speak evil of no man. To be no brawler, but gentle. 
showing all meekness to all men. For we ourselves also were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. That's how we used to be. Defiant, angry, get even, malice, harboring all this ill will, resentment. You know why I quit listening to a lot of the news commentators? Because that's how they'll make you. Angry, resentful, defiant, rebellious. And, and look, it, we believe we're living in the last days. We can't afford to have these attitudes. Not only that, but there's some that I won't listen to because they make me... When they start saying, look, you better move to the hills somewhere and uh, dig a hole in the ground and you better start storing up some weapons. I, I have weapons, but I don't have any plan on using them against my fellow human beings. I certainly don't plan on using them against my own government, which some are now advocating within the realm of Christian circles. The Bible says you do just the opposite. You be subject to those who are in authority. They come and they want to take away your gun. Give them your gun. They're the authority. I didn't write it. I didn't write it. We used to be foolish, disobedient, deceived, angry. Hateful. That's how we used to be. But notice verse 4. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior towards man appeared. Yeah. Christ came for us. Here's what our attitude is to be. That's the divine protocol. You're living in the last days. Here is our orientation. Here's how we respond. But. Even in submitting to the government, let's remember this, and I'm closing with this, you trust God. We always trust God. No matter what's going on around us, your faith is in God. My faith is not in my government. It's not in my country, not in my president. Not, my faith is not in the law and order of society. It's a lawless world and growing increasingly so. My faith must be in God. My faith must be in Christ. The Lord Himself said, have faith in God. You trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him. He will direct your paths. And we're going to need His direction in these last days. We're, we need it every day. But you know what? It's time for us to hang up. Hang up our own rationale, our own reasonings. Trying to figure everything out your own way. Hang that up and put on faith. And we're going to trust the Lord today, tomorrow, and however long he, uh, he allows us to be here, we're going to trust Him to provide for us, to protect us, to keep us, to shelter us, to feed us. I am not going to fall into the snare of uh, figuring out how I'm going to store up all kinds of food for the last days or buying rations that will last for ten years. I'm not going to fall into that. I'm, I'm going to trust the Lord. Uh, I mean, we'll make our little hurricane preparations to, to whatever degree we can. But when it comes to these last days, you know, if you store all of that up, then what? Now you're going to defend it? What if somebody's hungry? So you take a step close, I'll shoot you. You'd have to give it away if you store it up. What are you going to do? You're not going to feed the hungry with it? Store it up. Go ahead, but be prepared to dispense it to everybody who's hungry. Because there's, you know, you might as well trust the Lord. Just determine, you know, I'm going to trust the Lord. I'm going to trust Him right now to preserve me, keep me, and bring me through. And uh, I'm also asking Him to get me out of here before, before the hammer actually falls. <laughs> See, I still believe there's going to be a rapture. I believe that's becoming increasingly unpopular to believe these days, but I do believe there's going to be a rapture. I believe there's going to be a pre-tribulation rapture. And I'm praying that, Lord, let me be in that number when the saints go marching in. <laughs> Lord, let me be in that number. The Lord will look after us, protect us, preserve us, keep us. 
heal us. Uh, the divine protocol, I do believe He's going to call us into a time of faith, of trust, of simplicity, where we realize all of our faith and hope and trust has to be in Him. And that's definitely the days that we're rushing towards right now. There's coming a day when the only way you'll be able to get medical care is to take a mark. There's coming a day when the only way you'll be able to get rations is to take a mark. I mean, the Bible says that's going to happen. Again, my plan is to be gone when that day comes. That's plan A. Plan B is, it looks like some, some may lose their heads, but, <laughs> but that's all right too, because this world's not our home. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Well, the Lord says, the fear of man brings a snare, but whosoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. So let's put our trust in Him. Father, we pray today that You would help us to do just that. Lord, my prayer is that none of this would instill fear in our hearts, but Lord, let it instill faith. Lord, help us to orient ourselves to the times in which we live. Help us to see that it is a time to seek the Lord, to, to draw near to You, to be close to You. Lord, to be close to one another. It's a time to trust. It's a time for faith. It's a time for worship. It's a time for prayer. It's a time to be sober. It's a time to proclaim your word with boldness and clarity. It's a time to pray in our loved ones and time to proclaim your word without compromise. Help us, Lord, to achieve that end, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen, amen. Amen. Praise God.